Yeah, LJM's uh, pretty much a, a parcel consultancy, right? So we help shippers find efficiencies in their supply chain, negotiate better rates with the carriers, audit their invoices. Uh, we do provide some consulting on distribution center, warehouse design. So basically any large parcel shipper, we help them pull some cost out of their supply chain, be, be a little more efficient, and then just being up with today's trends and best practices in the industry. Thomas and I both have a background with the carriers. I spent uh, longer than I care to admit with UPS, and uh, Thomas has a uh, has a DHL background. So that gives us a you know pretty broad market perspective on on what shippers needs and how they can benefit. Got it. No, that's great. Thank you guys. Um, and again, thanks for doing this for everybody listening. Um, and please participate if you have questions either raise your hand chime in we'll try to find you and spotlight you um and and if you could you know it helps to just turn the camera on we do have a question or alternatively if you prefer to you know i can ask some questions too for you if you just want to email me at jfeldman at telsegroup.com i'll do that as well um but we do have a bunch of questions for you guys just given that the, the market is so dynamic especially the last mile side of things and um you know, I guess maybe just to start off, you could share what you're thinking about how things have trended really since the holiday season. I know there were a lot of surcharges this past holiday season. We talked about that, I think, on our last call and maybe do a, a sort of a, a download from that and where we stand today um, with regard to charge rates and fees and charges and the, the, the whole supply chain process, I guess. Sure, sure. I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and, and take that. So, uh, you know, it's it's been interesting. You're 100% right, Joe. The, the holiday season 2022 saw some increased fees again with peak season surcharges and so forth. And then, of course, um, between then and now, both carriers, UPS and FedEx, implemented historically high general rate increases. Um, the published rate increase on that was 6.9%, but that uh, first of all, it's a non-linear increase. So a lot of shippers may have had more or less on, on that. Plus, that doesn't include a lot of their accessorial charges increases. So the shippers are paying a lot more <laughs> in uh, in uh, April 2023 than they were in, uh, in April 2022. Um, and, you know, there's been a lot of things that uh, we saw the last few years where we're kind of moving back toward, I don't know that I can go as far as saying a state of normalcy. <laughs> but uh, maybe a, a state of slightly less disruption. Um, you know, a lot of the, the bottlenecks that we saw during the pandemic has, have eased, um, you know, but on the other hand, some of the other trends, like it's still hard to find people in a lot of locales, um, prices have increased significantly. So, you know, some things have really helped, uh, you know, as, with the evolution of time, um, but there's still some challenges that, that haven't gone away yet. Got it. Got it. And, and I guess, you know, w with regard to some of that, you know, you mentioned like the bottlenecks easing a little bit. Where, where has that, I mean, we hear a lot about container freight costs having come down, but, you know, from the last mile perspective, have you, you know, what are you seeing there where it's eased? Yeah, I, I can take that. So, um, yeah, I, I, I agree on that where, uh, I think there are a number of different bottlenecks to certainly consider. I think the one uh, that that sort of near and dear to us is the potential for uh, a UPS strike this year. So that would be coming on August 1st if it does occur. Um, and of course, uh, the the leader there on the on the Teamster side is Sean O'Brien, and and he's sort of to to some degree painting himself into corner uh, that he's going to be much tougher uh, during these negotiations than uh, than. Uh, the people prior to him, um, and of course, on the other side, uh, the leader at UPS uh, being Carol Tomei, she's been uh, obviously very aggressive in, in many things that she has done since she came on board, uh, benefiting to a certain extent uh, uh, from the pandemic to be able to, uh, with all the volume growth and so forth, to be able to push a lot of the, the less profitable companies out, increase rates substantially. Um, so they're, you know, in terms of looking on paper, UPS looks really good, and of course, the Teamsters want a, a, a portion of that uh, from his perspective, Sean O'Brien's perspective. So, I think um, you know that is that is that is the potential for a big bottleneck, and I bring that up just because 
railway uh, went through sort of a similar situation or the rails went through a similar situation in 2022, uh, you deal with some of the same in terms of labor disputes and so forth at the ports. Um, so that's a, a sort of consistent factor uh, that I think is uh, something to certainly consider. And of course, if there were a strike, um, which is probably the, the likelihood of that happening this year, uh, is probably the highest that it's really been. The last time we had one was in 1997. Uh, and at that point, it lasted just over two weeks. So uh, something like that would be pretty crippling to already sort of a, um, you know, not not a, you know, not an economy that's that's certainly crashing, but but some concern about some economic uh, downturn, uh, something like this would certainly have a, a crippling effect on, um, uh, on the economy in general, just because those packages, uh, no one else can pick those up. You know, you can, FedEx will take on a portion, but they're not going to invest in 100,000 employees like they would for a holiday peak uh, to prepare for a potential for UPS strike um, when it's just uncertain. You know, we don't know whether or not it will happen. So uh, there's not much to, for them to gain in terms of uh, if there's strike for a, a week or two, uh, they only get those packages for a week or two. You know, they're not going to hold on to those uh, shippers. So I think that's probably the biggest uh, potential bottleneck that, that we're facing within supply chain. Got it. Now, Thomas, when you say crippling, would that be a short term or would, could that like blow up the whole holiday season theoretically because everything's just back, backlogged and... Yeah, no, it, it won't be. It won't be that bad. I, I think when okay. I say crippling, it really depends how long it goes on for. I can't imagine that it would last for uh, more than a week or two if it were to occur. Um, um, I mean, there's there's just, but but certainly in terms of what that does in terms of stalling things out, because that's the that's the end of of supply chain, right? I mean, that's the uh, like you talked about. That's basically the last mile. So yeah. to no longer have uh, what more than half of shippers uh, consider to be their primary carrier to to uh, carry that out um, it certainly puts everyone in a really tough spot. And then, of course, there is that uh, build up behind so forth that that'll have to ease. Uh, but yeah, carrying into the the holiday peak, uh, I don't anticipate that that would be an issue at all. Got it. Okay. Okay. That makes sense. Um, and when you guys say like, you, you know, with, you know, Kenneth, you mentioned the fees, you know, historically high, just rate increase in fee for, for this year. Is that inflation related or how are they justifying that at this point? Because especially if it sounds like the system is working a little more efficiently these days, things are smoother. So it's what, what what's, what's behind that, I guess. Yeah, that, that's a great question, and I don't know that they work real hard to justify it. It's uh, <laughs> it's uh, because they can. Um, now, again, the 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 rate increase in twenty twenty three was in an environment of very high inflation, right? And I think you know that's going to continue into twenty you know for next year's increase for twenty twenty four. You not only do you still have an inflationary environment, but as Thomas mentioned, you're going to have. UPS is going to have to pay for a new Teamsters contract, which is likely going to be expensive. FedEx is going through a very um, extensive network consolidation, which in the end should be a huge cost savings to them. But in the interim, it's going to be expensive. So they're going to have to pay uh, for that. I mean, even Amazon, you know, they have a lot of um, they've got some headwinds, too, with significant layoffs. They're divesting from some of their distribution centers. Um, so they've got some costs to cover as well. So I, I really don't see that changing much, um, you know, in, in the in the coming year. Um, and as long as there's a, a desire for their services and there's not an, uh, a viable alternative, then then, you know, one of my one of my maxims is the only things sure in life are death taxes and the UPS rate increase. <laughs> got it. OK, OK. The, now. You know, one question actually just came in from from somebody uh, on on the call. Uh, sorry to shift gears a little bit, but it, on this UPS discussion and FedEx discussion, you know, Amazon claims they now have a, a last mile network as big as UPS. How does that factor in? Does that ultimately help provide more capacity to to UPS, like give back to UPS and FedEx? Does it? 
I guess I'll leave it high level and we can drill down in there, but yeah, it absolutely does. Um, you know, as, as Amazon takes more and more and more of their packages in house, that's fewer and fewer and fewer packages UPS is delivering. And of course, UPS built out significant infrastructure to handle those Amazon shipments. So for non Amazon shippers, it's, it's absolutely a benefit. Right. It, it frees up capacity uh, that UPS can use for for other shippers. And, you know, in the long run, I think it's beneficial to UPS, too, because they're taking packages that they're probably making one or two percent margin on and filling it with packages that they can make a much higher margin on because the, the shipper doesn't have the buying power that uh, that an Amazon would have. So. Um, so, yeah, in, in general, the more Amazon pulls out of the UPS network, the better it tends to be for um, for other other shippers. Okay. Now, I, oh, go ahead. Add to that, um, if it's specific to this year and the potential for a strike, I don't see it coming into play. Uh, so we have to keep in mind that Amazon, FedEx, and, and UPS all have a very different model, um, and those models – you know, still require that Amazon leans on UPS for um, for shipments that just don't fit into their their network, right? But um, again, where uh, Amazon is uh, has a a structure in a uh, you know in, in a uh, in an area that just is is you know has has greater population and so forth and has that infrastructure to support it. That's where you're no longer seeing. UPS make those deliveries as often, you know, unless it's one of those rare products that they don't uh, tend to, to carry. But this is where sort of AI plays into where when you shop on Amazon um, and you choose, hey, I want to buy a you know, set of toothbrushes, look, it's going to push all the products that are available within that, that same day or next day footprint if possible, uh, basically out of their DC where they can service uh, that part with uh, their local carriers rather than utilizing a UPS uh, versus, uh, you know, a customized blanket. Well, that probably has to be fulfilled, uh, you know, somewhere else. And then UPS might be the, the carrier choice. So, um, but in terms of getting through, you know, this year, uh, I don't see the two models working out. You couldn't say, look, I, you know, UPS is not going to be able to take our packages come August 1st. So let's partner with, with Amazon. Uh, you could partner with FedEx, um, and at that point, uh, FedEx does obviously have the model, and they did have a April 1st or, or March 31st deadline for new customers. Uh, what we saw there was that they extended it to the end of April because they didn't get as many customers probably shifted over as they anticipated, and I expect that that will be pushed back again. So if there was someone that had a, a dire concern for if UPS goes on strike, I need a backup plan, and they are going single carrier, then FedEx would be a viable option. Um, and they're back, you know, their service levels are back to what they have been uh, prior to 2021 being the really bad year and so forth. And I, I guess I can go on and on, but but I guess to, to answer the question directly, Amazon's not the solution based on uh, the typical model today for most uh, shippers. Okay. That kind of may have answered my next question, but do you see Amazon becoming the third big shipper in the country then? Not just for Amazon goods, but broadly, you know, like they have AWS and they have other, you know, thing elements that they sell to others. Could, does that happen? Like are UPS and FedEx worried about that at some point or? Yeah, you know, I guess I'll I'll take the beginning of that. Maybe Thomas, you can you can round out my answer. So it's certainly a possibility, and you know that was part of the rationale of when FedEx decoupled from Amazon, saying you know we don't want to continue to enable a potential com competitor. Um, you know, one in in talking to our client base, which is you know covers a lot of industries, and one of the biggest concerns with with Amazon becoming a common carrier, and you know personally, I'd be all for it. Um, you know, the more competition, the better. Uh, but one of the concerns is, you know, if you give your packages to UPS, you aren't worried about UPS becoming a competitor in your industry. Uh, Amazon, you, you, you don't have that assurance. So yielding to Amazon all of your shipping data uh, is, could be a concern. 
Okay. Uh, so I think that's a headwind they would face. Now, I'm sure a lot of organizations may not worry about that at all. Uh, but I, I think that would be a significant barrier to entry to them with, with um, you know, industries that don't sell on Amazon that don't want uh, Amazon as a potential competitor. Um, but they do have a pretty extensive network. And obviously, it would be easier for them to move into that um, to that space than someone else would. And I'll, I'll let, let Thomas um, uh, supplement that. Yeah, I, I think you, you're you spot on. And maybe the only thing I would add is, uh, and just expanding on in terms of the infrastructure, um, you know, that's such a big uh, component when it comes to, um, you know, obviously being able to compete with UPS and FedEx. You saw DHL, even with the acquisition of Airborne, um, you know, even before the economic downturn in 2008, uh, they still struggled, you know, and, and, and I could say that because I was there at the time. Uh, it's such a challenging uh, position to be in, which is why you also see these regional carriers now with, um, you have OnTrack that that uh, acquired LaserShip or, or maybe merged, whatever, however you want to view that, um, with now trying to get an East Coast and West Coast presence. But to try to build that organically becomes very challenging. So I think uh, Amazon, to a large extent, has overcome that uh, challenge. And what they do better than anyone else is just continue down that path and just sort of work their way out. Um, and at some point, I think they'll have the infrastructure. Um, even now, I mean, they could afford to take that on themselves, but they're utilizing UPS because they can, I think, to a certain extent of, look, let's give these packages that would cost us $10. And, and by having UPS carry it out, it costs us six. You know, it just it would be stupid as not to. Um, sure. But I'm I'm pretty certain that when you start looking a few years down the road, uh, Amazon becomes a, a a viable threat, a direct threat. Got it. Okay. Okay. Um, another topic I, I know we had wanted to address with you guys, and sorry, maybe jumping around from that list I sent you, uh, Thomas. You had mentioned AI, um, and we keep hearing about it. It's like every retailer that all of us on this call talk to throws out AI machine learning and, you know, they all think they can implement it or use it. And some have actually been using it, but how do you guys see AI playing a role in sort of the whole supply chain and last mile and where things stand from your perspective? Yeah, th this one's interesting, right? Because I think the, the initial thought is, look, AI has been around for, for years. Um, I mean, when you look at uh, the concept of Alexa and 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 so forth, right? Or or you're shopping for something, and and all of a sudden that same product in a different color shows up, or um, you know recommend recommendations are made. So just from a shopping experience, I think um, you know a large number of, of retailers or a large number of um, uh, you know just companies in general, uh, AI is is there and and in place. Then you can expand on, do you get into the, um, you know, even the self-driving trucks, you know, do you get into drones, which is, you know, obviously that's that's inevitable as well, in part because of the, uh, you know, driver shortages that are expected over the next five to 10 years as well. So there's there's that need for something to, to fill those gaps. Um, uh, drones been on sort of the talks for a long time. And then of course it, you know, it's still active, but it's, it's, maybe less sort of sexy today than it was five years ago, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, but again, I think that'll come into play. Um, so, but at the same time, I think in terms of, I think we're only scratching the surface. I mean, what's, what's, you know, interesting about AI is that it builds upon itself. So, you know, you, you look at things where, uh, from my perspective, we're a technology firm and, you know, we love data and, and, you know, we, we build sort of you know great dashboards and, and things that tell you just it gives you a lot of information and it's just a matter of sort of how deep you want to get into that um, and even where we were five to ten years ago versus now when you start looking at what that data tells you very quickly is pretty amazing but I think it's, it's just going to continue to develop on itself and so forth and um, uh, I mean I, I think you can go on and on but yeah AI is is definitely a, a critical component and already there for the large majority, it just depends on to what extent, um, you know, it is there, you know, and, and the fact that Alexa is eavesdropping on me right now, I mean, it's a <laughs> perfect example of, you know, how, how AI is here, right? Yeah. And Joe, just to add on to that, um, 
you know, from a carrier perspective, you know, FedEx has an AI uh, initiative called FedEx Surround. And what that does is it takes all the package information, its location, the type of truck it's in, its geographic location. And then it also looks at outside information like weather and traffic patterns so that they can make real time adjustments. You know, hey, if this truck is headed toward a, uh, a traffic issue, let's divert it to try to make delivery on time. So and, and that's, you know, in, it's still in its infancy. But as that becomes more robust and, and um, builds out that that could really help the delivery performance of the carriers because it's taking not just its own network information, but outside information and overlaying those um, to get the best result. Got it. Got it. Okay. So they actually, they're starting to use it as well. It sounds like that's great. Um, and are there, I guess as, as you guys work maybe with your client base, are, are there some that are better positioned, like, or I don't know if you, you probably don't want to share names, but, you know, are there certain sectors that seem like they're more advanced with this? Like the big box guys, like, uh, you know, I was saying before we got on the call to Kenneth and Thomas, for everybody listening, that Walmart just had a big analyst day and all it was was about the back end and more efficient supply chain and leveraging AI and technology to make that happen. And I'm just curious if you guys are getting more inbound demand from your customers on with regard to that. Yeah, do you want me to take that, Kenneth? Sure. I, yeah. Either way. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I mean, and I think Walmart's a great example. The one that sort of sticks out to me, uh, and, and you're right, it's, it's hard to talk about our clients because we all we have the NDAs with all of them and, and uh, yeah. want to be cautious there. But the one that, uh, or there's a couple that sort of stand up, but, you know, Target to me is one that has sort of built built this pretty well. Um, and, and all the way through from, uh, look, the goal with these guys, especially brick and mortar, is they want the foot traffic. So they, you know, goal number one is how do I get you into the store? Because that's when you inevitably buy something else. Um, but then if I can't get you into the store, now what are the options that I need to make available to you that you'll continue to utilize our service? And that's where sort of I, I like Target's position where um, they made it easy to to walk in, get your product if you want to walk back out. They've set up um, the majority of locations, you know, uh, spots where you can just pull up, you know, tell them that you're there, they bring it out. Uh, then you can start using the app. If, uh, if it's available at the local store, um, you know, they uh, set up shipped, you know, they, they, uh, where they not only offer Target products, but they offer through grocery stores and pet stores and all kinds of things. Um, where they can utilize that. And that gets us more into sort of that same day, um, you know, delivery within two or three, four hour time frame. Um, and, uh, and of course, if those things aren't available and it's not available in the store, then you can still have it shipped to you typically for free. So they offer a variety of options based on, on that. And I don't know if that directly answers your question, but uh, since you mentioned Walmart, uh, you know, looking at the two, they, they cater sort of a different, um, uh, target audience, right? So Walmart being a bit more rural, a bit more uh, probably dependent on that foot traffic than than Target is. Target's done a great job of of you know going in more of a a technology type direction, I guess. You know, to, by offering additional methods and so forth. And I think largely based on their target audience. You know, so I think both of those companies have done a really good job. Um, and and you can get into a number of other ones that operate in similar fashion, but, but, uh, those stand out. No, that, that's really helpful. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and Joe, maybe I, I could, I'll share one without sharing the company name. We have one clothing retailer that, um, as Thomas mentioned, the, the buy online pickup in store, they have an AI program that, um, you know, if you buy a shirt and you come to pick it up their their program will predict other items you may want with that shirt based on past purchases and the store will have those sitting out with your shirt in case you want to uh, oh, want wow. to purchase that so it uses past purchase information of folks that bought that item in order to couple others to try to get uh, multiple purchases out of that pickup so there's really some very interesting applications for it and some of them are very targeted and some of them are or more uh, general but it, it's really interesting to see how it's being applied now oh that's great 
That's really cool. Thank you guys for sharing that. Um, and again, to everybody listening, if you guys have questions, please chime in. Um, capacity. Where do things stand? You know, so we here, we collectively on the call hear from the retailers that, you know, things are getting a lot better. The supply chain sort of operating smoothly. It's back to normal. And, you know, they should start to see benefits from this in the second half of the year. A lot of it driven by lower ocean freight, but they do say there's still headwinds with domestic freight last mile. And I guess I'm just wondering what you guys are seeing across the whole supply chain in terms of capacity and areas where there could be maybe gains this year that in the face of pressures last year. Yeah, and I'll, I'll go ahead and start with that one. So it, it's definitely eased, and it's kind of a combination of two things. You you had organizations adjust to the high um, demand during the, the pandemic, so they built out capacity, both carriers and, and retailers. And now you have higher capacity, yet lower demand. Lower demand, so um, you know the good. The good part about that is is, is there's not that many capacity constraints. Uh, now again, I'm, we always come at it from an, a parcel angle, much more so than an ocean freight angle or something sure. else. But but that's that's typically what what we're seeing. So of course the good um, the good news is there seems to be plenty of capacity. The bad news, of course, is half of that equation is because the demand is is uh is slowing but you know there there's been some other best practices implemented during the pandemic that i think also help uh the capacity so for example peak season and even things like back to school season all that they they've just pushed earlier right so instead of a big a big um, a huge push in, in a small window the windows are getting larger and larger and larger and that that takes a lot of pressure off of that supply chain. So some of those behaviors I think will never go away, right? Just because of the scar tissue uh, left over yeah. the last few years. Uh, but it helps, right? The, the longer you can make those windows, the, uh, the better and, and um, you know, the less pressure there is on things. You know, the, the one thing I think will, that will create some continuing um, capacity issues in certain areas is just the lack of labor, right? La labor is still a problem in a lot of places. And uh, until that really gets resolved, it, it won't won't completely go away. But we're in far better shape uh, going into 2023 than we were the last few years. Okay. Yeah. The, the only thing I would add to that is, um, you, you know, there's there's always well, there's almost always a bottleneck somewhere. So as you loosen up the bottleneck in one place, now you you create a bottleneck somewhere else. So, um, you know, part of what this you know challenge with getting your product in um, uh, created was people started ordering things sooner, people started ordering ordering in bigger bulk so that they had this uh, available. Uh, now when things come in and now they don't really have a place to store it, uh, I would say the one bottleneck that we sort of encounter now, probably more so than anything else, is on the warehouse side. So now you're seeing warehouses get filled up and so forth because they have to store this, um, and what they want to do. Uh, you know, it, again, considering over the past couple of years, when you when you don't have anything on the shelves for weeks at a time, sometimes months at a time, they'd rather have that inventory sitting somewhere and paying a little bit for it um, and at least have it available to them than to uh, give up on it entirely and, and for someone to walk in and walk back out because there's there's you know, there's nothing on the shelves. So um, I think the bottleneck moves around, but the bottleneck in today's world is probably a little more manageable than uh, then when your your containers are sitting off the coast of LA and and you know you just you know you're like look I could just send the boat out there to 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 bring it in if if that would help but there's just nowhere to bring it. Got it. Okay. Okay. Two, and two, um, two, okay. Two years ago, <clears throat> when there were large bottlenecks on the West Coast, a lot of shippers said they were going to start utilizing the East Coast uh, more aggressively. Now, two years later, has the picture changed at all? Yeah, it, that's a great question. Yeah, it definitely has. In fact, um, Savannah is now the busiest port in the country, taking that over from uh, from Long Beach. And that's exactly the reason. 
Um, well, that and the labor constraint, right? There, there's been some labor disruptions in California, um, and that's pushed a lot to the East Coast. And, and Savannah has been one of the primary beneficiaries of that. So, yes, it, it's, it absolutely has changed. You know, another thing has changed a little bit of that is there's been some reshoring and some some um, diversity in in origin from away from China since the pandemic, and that of course creates you know there's been been more uh, movement to Latin America and, and to India, and of course that that creates a little more diversity of poor access than than just everything coming from China would. Uh, the East Coast ports. Uh has built up in infrastructure wise as the West Coast? You know, that's a that's an interesting question too. Um, so it it it's just like every other answer, it, it depends. So Savannah's in great shape. Uh, Charleston is um, you know, they just went through a large uh, dredging so they could actually get larger container ships in there. Um, so there there's there's uh, Jacksonville's made some improvements, Richmond's made some improvements. So they're on the way. I, whether I could say they're on par, I don't, I don't feel comfortable enough um, making that that delineation yet. Um, but but there's we're, we're certainly seeing a shift, which um, you know I think is beneficial considering the bottlenecks we had had. Thank you. The, um, do, do you see the, the carriers being able to be more? efficient like kenneth you were talking about like that fedex you know taking in a lot more real-time data um but will they ever get to a point where they really can say deliver to at least even maybe not a, a street but a neighborhood and have more density on a given day than than not you know would that free them up you know that, that seems to be the holy grail is like to be able to do, deliver to one area everything that you need rather than the morning the night and are they getting better at that? Yeah, I, and I'll, I'll let Thomas chime in on this one too. But yeah, I, I, they absolutely are. Um, you know, and the metrics and the uh, tracking that they use is is definitely uh, better. You know, one thing that's really helped is the the e-commerce boom has really increased the delivery density to non-commercial areas, which lowers their cost, right? And I think. One thing I'm really excited about is to see where FedEx ends up after this network integration. You know, this is something we talked about. They should be, they should have done 20 years ago. <laughs> um, but the fact that they're doing it now, I'm, I'm just really hopeful that uh, it yields the kind of benefits, not only cost benefits to them, but efficiency benefits that it, that it could. And uh, I, I, I would, I would think that we would see some significant, time in transit and performance improvements for them, which of course would start to push UPS a little bit uh, as well. But I'm, I'm, I'm really bullish on, uh, on, on how that, that turns out for FedEx and okay. we're watching that closely because I think that could really benefit, you know, their whole, their whole customer base. Got it. Yeah. yeah I, was, I, oh, go ahead. Um, I was going to say, I, I would double down on, on what kind of said about FedEx and that's you know, only about maybe 14 to 15 months away if, if things go as planned. Um, and I think you know, even companies that you deal with, you know, one of their concerns or one of their issues with FedEx is, you know, express drops off in the morning, then ground comes by, then there's a home delivery guy, you know, it's like there's all these different carriers. Um, and even, you know, those that aren't necessarily as green conscientious as others, uh, they're still, uh, you know, cognizant of, of the waste that's associated with that. So, uh, one thing I would add is, uh, you know, and this goes back, and, and I think both companies have been pretty good at doing this, but UPS probably a little bit more so. Um, you know, when you go years back, I mean, the, the way that they dealt with some of the holiday peaks was they would set up uh, pretty much, you know, a U-Haul truck or, or something in neighborhoods. They would then make a mass delivery to that neighborhood. Um, then there'd be a person, whether it's on a bike or um, you know, screw or whatever else, they're basically just running those packages to the individual house. So now you're able to utilize um, what would otherwise be considered a labor shortage in terms of the number of people that can drive a truck or the number of trucks that are available, make that mass delivery, and then uh, create a little delivery network within. Um, I've even seen situations where uh, UPS is using a golf cart to uh, leave a UPS store to make the, you know, so they're utilizing uh, these various outfits and so okay. forth. So I think it's just natural that we'll see more of that. And of course, 
uh, supply chain, when you look at it to that level of granularity, it really is about getting the product the closest you can to the final destination. So if you have those resources available, um, instead of having a truck drive around the neighborhood for three hours, if you can utilize other types of labor at a more affordable cost um, and in a greener way, I think it, it all certainly makes sense to do so. Makes sense. Makes sense. Yeah, I mean, do, do you, you know, on that topic, Tom, like, do you, you mentioned driver shortages and, and Kenneth, you mentioned labor pressure a few times. Does that ever get alleviated in the near term? Or is it just that, you know, people see the coming, you know, autonomous vehicles or drones, as you mentioned, and so they're just not willing to go down that path? Is that is that the biggest issue at this point that people face getting drivers or, do you, you know, will that alleviate in the near term? Cause that seems like it's going to be a headwind that the, that we're all going to be paying for, for a little while. I keep hoping that Kenneth chimes in on this. One. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can do that. Yeah. I, I don't, I don't know that that's, um, I don't know how much thought people are putting into that because look, okay. it's coming, but you know, with the technology and regulatory environment, I don't think it's going to be here as soon as maybe we would have thought so five years ago. Um, yeah, I, I think it's just, uh, you know, first of all, so if we take it on the, on the UPS side, um, you don't just get to be a driver. You got to go through for the most part, you got to be a part-time employee and go through the, the, process there and then you bid for it so you can't just w roll up to a ups store and say hey i want to be a driver making 24 dollars an hour 27 dollars an hour there's a process involved there and it's it's not really an easy one um so i think that calls out uh you know some of the potential applicants and then on the fedex side at least you know traditionally a lot of their drivers are those contract ground drivers so you're not really guaranteed anything you're a contractor and you might make money and you might lose money. And I think that discourages a lot of participation. Um, and for the long haul drivers, all of those have to have to have been delivery drivers first. So again, there's a there's a, a culling process that happens. And I think that really, you know, depresses the number of people that, um, you know, that that can do that. So, you know, that's just a, a systemic constraint. And I don't know if that's going to change anytime, anytime soon or not. I got it. Okay. And then um, I know we're kind of near the end here um, of our time, but uh, do you guys foresee, like, will, will pack it, will, will prices ever really stabilize? You know, like, it, it, it seems like, I mean, as you guys say, every time we do these calls, there's always the new, you know, fee increases each year. There's um, surcharges and all the assessments and all the other things that you talk about. I always ask, you know, what's the average price to ship a, a package, like say a, to send a shirt like this, how much would it cost? And it feels like it's not going down, even though much more volume is happening. Like, so in other industries, when scale happens, you know, you see volume pricing come down, but that's, will, will it ever in shipping or the, the retails have to deal with this for forever, basically? Yeah, I, uh, I'll go first, Thomas, and let you, uh, without an, another alternative, Right. So most other industries aren't oligopolies. So until there is another viable option, uh, uh, an Amazon or uh, or an expanded on track or whatever that happens to be, uh, there's just not enough competitive pressure to, to create a need for it to go down. Right. When there's only when there's only two real options and as yeah. long as they follow suit um, now, it, it it's very possible the, the, the pace of increases may decline, um, but to, to see them stop or reverse, um, you know, I've been in this business since um, 1992 and it, and it hasn't yet. So I don't know that I would, I would bet anything on it happening anytime soon. Got it. Yeah, I, I would just add there, um, when you look at the history, sort of starting with that, that Kenan mentioned, you know, the, the carriers over time have moved from, um, you know, dim weights didn't apply up to three cubic feet. They put parameters in there that it would, um, and I think for a good reason. I mean, it got to a point where you're getting huge boxes with, with nothing in them. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, because someone wants to just carry three box sizes. 
Um, so there's there's been change that's that's good uh, that has forced companies to start using more appropriate box sizes, for example, because they would be uh, penalized heavily as a result of not. Uh, but in terms of the only the only cost that they apply that tends to fluctuate in the in the favor of of the shipper is a fuel, and that's because they're based on indexes that uh, will fluctuate not on a weekly basis. But even those, they've applied increases to uh, over the years and just sort of folded them in, uh, where it's say, hey, look, in two weeks, we're just going to apply a, an additional 1% um, increase on that fuel index, sort of just flies on the radar. And a lot of people think, since they have a contract in place, that that they're not subject to those issues. But of course, the service guides always supersede the contract. So unless the, the contract specifically states in this example, uh, you know, you'll you'll pay, um, you know, a set amount on fee, which I don't think I've ever seen such a contract, at least not for the typical shipper. Um, they may have discounts, but then the baseline is still going to increase substantially. So um, I don't I don't see it going uh, certainly anywhere downwards. And I think they can continue to apply their 5.9, 6.9% increases, apply new charges when they can. And uh, costs will only go up uh, as until there's a real competitive threat, um, and that could be Amazon. Yeah, and Joe, I would I would say the biggest thing pricing wise to look forward to is I think the introduction of peak season surcharges is the first step into true surge pricing for the carriers. Like I think in a few years we're going to see price variations throughout the year, not just peak. You know. Uh, price increases for Mother's Day, price increases for Valentine's Day, probably not Father's Day because we don't get a whole lot. But, you know, the price increases around shipping events and they wouldn't even surprise me. You know, I was in industrial engineering for UPS and the biggest pickup days were always Monday and Tuesday. I, it would not surprise me to see surge pricing on the day of the week. If you ship out a package on Monday, it'll cost different than if you ship out the same package on Thursday, you, the same way. You know, uh, sporting events might charge different amounts depending on who the opponent is and movie movie theaters charge different amounts depending on the time of the showing. I think we're headed there in the parcel market. So I think wow. the pricing will get more and more convoluted, more and more confusing. And I think it could change uh, not only on time of year, but but possibly even even the day of the week. Wow. It's kind of scary for the, at least for our coverage, the retailers that we're worrying about. You yeah. Know, it, 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 it's interesting because I think, uh, isn't Amazon now even charging a dollar if you return something to, um, through UPS where they used to never do that. And I, so That's, yep. it just seems like the retailers yeah. are going to have a real tough time. They're going to have to push people to the store as much as they possibly can. Yeah, or, or change, push to a change in behavior. You know, I could see, you know, I've, I've talked to some of our retailers about this. So it makes sense for, say, a UPS to say, look, we want less packages on Monday and more on Thursday. So we're going to charge less if you ship it on Thursday. Then a retailer response can be, hey, if you want your package in two days from Monday, it'll cost this much in shipping. But if you're willing to wait and let me ship it out on Thursday, we could charge you less on shipping. So it's going to be this, and, and I think the retailers that adjust the fastest to the changes in pricing are the ones that are going to be, you know, best positioned because they can, um, you know, make that adaptation and adjustment on, on the front end uh, instead of just saying, well, we'll just eat the additional cost or whatever if they make the same adjustments. And the hard thing, of course, is how do you make a dynamic adjustment and not make it incredibly frustrating for the, for your customer. Right. And, uh, and <laughs> I don't know the answer to that yet, but, uh, but uh, whoever figures that out, of course, will have an advantage. Understood. That makes sense. Um, I guess maybe one last parting question before we go. Um, any initial thought on what we should expect this holiday season? I remember last year, you, I think we, last time we did a call was September. And you had said that we would see like almost literally weekly or by, by every two weeks surcharge increases as you get closer to Christmas. Presumably that'll happen again. And anything else you're hearing that might happen this holiday season? Yeah, I can, I can jump in. I think, 
you know, as as we mentioned here a couple of times, once the carriers put something on the table and they do it, um, they they tend to have very repetitive behavior. So um, by applying surcharges, people accept those surcharges. It's an easy add-on. Uh, they don't really have to ask for too much permission to do so, uh, you know, and uh, we expect them to continue to do so. In terms of just the holiday outlook, uh, I think it'll be similar to what we experienced last year, which is um, I don't think there's a major, may, certainly a major crash. And I don't think there's any major increase. Uh, still relatively healthy, but obviously there's a push for uh, fewer maybe luxury items, especially amongst the sort of middle income than there would be in the past prior years. Um, and uh, but at the same time, I think the, the holiday season will still be relatively healthy. Yes, costs will go up in terms of uh, shipping and so forth for uh, those that are utilizing the major carriers. Now, again, those that are using uh, local resource, especially brick and mortar, where they can utilize, um, you know, sort of the local carrier type solutions, mm -hmm. uh, those costs can still remain in check and so forth to a certain extent. So uh, fuel prices will probably be lower than they were in this past year. Uh, although if we could predict those things, you know, we probably wouldn't be on this call. So uh, <laughs> no, no offense, of course. Yeah. Um, but I think that's the expectation as well, right? So uh, those would be my thoughts on that. That's great. Um, any last parting thoughts, guys? Otherwise, I think maybe we'll, we'll end it here and uh, appreciate your time. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you guys so much. We really appreciate it, Thomas and Kenneth. Uh, you guys are always so helpful and insightful on this stuff. So we appreciate it, and uh, we look forward to the next time we do this, uh, maybe in the fall. We'll, uh, we'll do it again. So thanks so That's much, guys. Our, it was our pleasure. Thanks for having us. Anytime. Thank you.